Strength and growth come only through continuous effort and struggle. Napoleon Hill. DZ Tribe, Josh Thomas, glad to have you here. To make sure you don't miss another episode, I want you to follow and subscribe to the Do Zone podcast on Apple and or Spotify. Also, if you're looking to better understand how you get stuff done, head on over to dozonedna.com and take our proprietary personality profile assessment, which is a lot of P's in a row, by the way, built specifically for busy entrepreneurs. It's going to show you how to build your world around you for optimal performance. Once again, that's dozonedna.com. Today's guest is Mr. Brian Clayton. Brian is the CEO and co-founder of GreenPal, an online marketplace that connects homeowners with local lawn care professionals. GreenPal has been called the Uber for Lawn Care by Entrepreneur Magazine and has over 200,000 active users, completing thousands of transactions per day. Brian, welcome to the Do Zone. Say what's up to the tribe and tell us something you believe is the key to getting stuff done that most people wouldn't think of. Well, thanks for having me on, Josh. It's great to be here. Uh, something that works for me to get stuff done that might sound a little weird to people is to do what I call add trip wires into your life. And so what do I mean by that? <clears throat> These are things that you kind of lay into the path of the core of like the normal like course of living your life that you trip over that cause you to kind of like be accountable. So I do this a few different ways. Uh, simple as simple as making like a commitment to a friend or getting a workout partner, or even as, as uh, all the way up to like hiring expensive coaches, expensive consultants in my business that uh, cause me to kind of like do all the little things day in, day out. I've got a lady that uh, works for our company, GreenPal, that helps me with data science, and she makes $1,000 an hour, charges me $1,000 an hour for her time. I meet with her once a week, and I better have my ducks in a row. I better have stared at the spreadsheets. I better have crunched the numbers when I meet with her. And so that's one little tripwire that I, that I have uh, to keep my business going. And, and a tripwire I have in my personal life is, is I have a running partner. You know, I, I meet, meet with him three times a week, and we go for a run together. So I think creating these little... Uh, I guess, commitments and things that you kind of like know you have to show up for, help you do the small things day in, day out that begin to compound over time. I, I love the idea of a tripwire. So tripwire can be used in many different ways. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, obvious, uh, the, the obvious application is, uh, you know, you're walking through a field and you've got a tripwire and it triggers the explosives or whatever, right? But, uh, but in marketing, a, a tripwire is it's exactly that it's something we put in the path of uh somebody who's going to join our funnel so that they trip over something and have to take an action and they have to change directions or go or leave or blow up or whatever <laughs> and so it's interesting that you use that term and you applied it to your life and uh me personally uh, i was uh, trying to kind of get back on the the health wagon for a while. It's one of those things that like I get on for a while and like, uh, this thing's going pretty slow. I'm going to get it's back so off. slow. <laughs> I'm going to get back off and go to party zone. You know, it's way more fun than health wagon. <laughs> uh, but one of the health things wagon sucks. I know, man, it is not fun. <laughs> it's like, it's really uncomfortable. The driver is like super rigid and he's not funny. Um, but uh, I realized that it's a lot more fun to get on the health wagon when you got somebody to do it with you. And so That's right. the, the only way I've been able to stay on uh, for the last, let's say, I think three months, I've been going to the gym five days a week. Only way I've been able to do that is because I know that there's somebody waiting on me at 550 in the morning in the parking lot. Exactly. And, and if I don't show up, I'm going to be like the worst friend ever. Yep. And it's not not showing up that one day that you lose, you lose the next two weeks that you don't show up because you lost the momentum. Big Mo, you lost Big Mo, you lost the momentum. And, and it's not just the one workout, it's the two weeks after that. It's, it's, it's hard to get started. And, I, and, the, and, and having an accountability partner helps me keep going. I, I actually, uh, I struggle with fitness. I struggle with keeping my weight off. And um, something else that I do is I have a little online coach uh, that I pay. And this, this guy is a professional bodybuilder. He charges me $200 a month, just $200 a month and tracks all of my food, lays out my workout. I have to check in with him once a week with progress photos, daily weight check-ins, making sure I hit all of the macros, all of the workouts. And like just that little $200 a month commitment keeps me in line, keeps me accountable 
to doing the things I know I should be doing, but man, it's so hard some days. <laughs> well, well, let's go back a little bit earlier and find some, find some other trip wires in your life. Uh, you're, you're running a successful business now and, and I'd, I'd love to hear about that maybe a little later, but, but let's go back before that. Uh, what, what initially got you into entrepreneurship to begin with, for instance? Yeah, I was dragged into entrepreneurship by my father, actually, and when I was 15 years old, and uh, he interrupted me uh, playing Nintendo and said, get off your butt. I got a gig for you. You're going to go mow the neighbor's yard. And I wasn't living in a democratic household. This was a direct order. And so he made me go mow the neighbor's yard. And I got paid like 20 bucks for an hour's worth of work. And ever since then, I was hooked. I thought, this is awesome. I just made $20 for an hour's work. Rather than having to do chores around the house or hassle my folks for money, I can just do this. This is the, this is the shit. So I'm just going to do this forever. And so I never looked back. And uh, that first summer, I made up some flyers and got like 20 customers in the neighborhood. And I stuck with this little lawn mowing business all through high school. And then uh, I didn't want to take on student loans to go through college. So I, 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 I put myself through college, mowing grass during the day, going to college at night. And then when I made, when I uh, graduated business school, I had to make a decision. Was I going to like go into the job market like my, my peers were and, uh, and, and quit mowing grass or stick with this lawn care company I had? And I didn't really want to be a lawn guy because uh, it really just didn't, it wasn't glamorous. It just didn't really feel like uh, something I could dedicate my life to. But just simple arithmetic, I would have to take a pay cut to uh, go get a job. So I was like, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to make a five-year plan using what little I learned in business school and see how far I could take this little landscaping company and um, work really hard, got, got some good people uh, on the journey with me, got lucky, and over a 15-year period of time, built one of the largest landscaping uh, companies in the Southeastern United States, ended up getting it over 150 employees, uh, eventually $10 million a year in sales, and then navigated that company all the way through successful acquisition, a national, a big, huge national conglomerate bought it and, uh, and, and in 2013. So after that, I took like a year off and I got bored and I thought, well, what do I want to do with my life now? Uh, something's missing. I don't have a mission. I don't have a project. I need to have that put back in my life. I thought, well, I don't want to, I don't want to have like a hard business like that was. I want to run something easy. I want to run a software business because that'll be so much easier. And boy, I didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> but, but it was naivete as an asset. And I had the idea for GreenPal that an app should exist. So you should be able to order a lawn mowing service from your smartphone rather than calling people and hassling people and leaving checks under the mat and stuff. And uh, recruited two co-founders and we started working on the idea. And now GreenPal, my current company, is a 10-year overnight success. We're nationwide in the United States, 300,000 people using our app to get lawn mowing services done. 32,000 small contractors like what I used to be uh, using the app. So it's 22 years, two businesses, kind of one industry. Um, and it goes quick and, and really, and really one brick at a time. It sounds like, yeah, it really is. You know, go, you know, my dad interrupted me playing Nintendo, but what, were what you, he didn't what know, what, were you playing? uh, Super Mario Kart. I'll yeah. never, uh, it was my favorite game back then still is. I don't have any game consoles. I haven't had any game consoles in 20 something years Yeah, because they're, they're too damn good. And I know all I'll do is sit around and play them all day. But, right. but uh, back then, man, I loved Mar Super Mario Kart. I was really good at it. And um, what he didn't realize was that business is kind of like a video game. You really just work one level at a time and you don't worry about, you know, you don't worry about Bowser when you're on levels one, two or three or four. And that's what holds a lot of founders up is, you know, you're, they're on level one, two or three and they're worried about Bowser related problems. When in fact, like you're on level one, you need, you need a hundred customers, go out and hustle up a hundred customers. Don't worry about, anything else until you get through level one then, then then throw all of your life's effort into level two and get through level two and so that's kind of how it unfolded for me over the last 22 years uh you know there's there's some wisdom in that don't worry about bowser when you're on level one two and three <laughs> i love that yeah so yeah, only, true. only people all do it. over a certain age may understand that i'm not sure but i don't uh, know if bowser's in the new iterations of those games or not yeah. he should be somebody needs to do a uh, remake <laughs> yeah right so uh but but the idea here is, uh, and and I have a I have another version of of that saying where I say, hey, you know, don't worry about problem number six, worry about problem that's right. number one. Uh, that's all. That's I mean, and it sounds trite, and it's hard to do. 
for instance, when I was starting Green Pal, um, my two co-founders and I, we, we, we launched the first app and uh, we spent three months on what we thought was the, the brand mascot because we read in a blog post somewhere that, uh, that your product should have a soul. Your product should have an identity. Your product should have this mascot that could carry the message and, and, and create a connection with your users. And that's true. But we spent three months designing this character to go on the homepage uh, called Gary the Green Pal. How his hat looked, what color were his shorts going to be? Did he have boots or tennis shoes? Should he have grass stains on his pants or not? And it was, I wish somebody would have come up and smacked me and said, you need, you need 100 customers. You're worried about this damn thing that doesn't matter right now. One day it will, you know, maybe, you know, once you get a, a million in sales, worry about something like this. But right now you need to go like pass out some door hangers to get some people to use this piece of crap. <laughs> it's, it's like we all, we all like get caught by that bright, shiny object syndrome and, and forget what level of the game we're at. And, and so that's why I, I just try to always beat that in my own head and, and share that. Well, it's it's an important lesson, uh, and I've worked with more than three thousand entrepreneurs uh, over the past decade, and uh, the overwhelming majority of them get stuck in this minutia uh, of, well, hey, there's this thing over here that I can do that's not the thing that I need to do, right? And uh, and it's and it's really an interesting phenomenon, and that's actually where the do zone was born, was to try to basically scientifically prove that uh you're you're messing around and you got to stop messing around and yep. and why do we do that you know why do you spend three months uh designing uh an avatar or a or a logo or a mascot uh when the real thing that you need to do is get 100 customers do you, do you have and i'm sure that you know i think you said you had a degree in business not psychology but but since you've been through it and now that you're on the other side of it Let's dissect that moment for a minute. Uh, and and why were you doing that instead of the thing you know you need to do? Not like I'm accusing you, but but let's break that down because so many people struggle with that same thing. Yeah, the, the thing is, is like usually in business and life, the harder thing to do is usually the right thing to do. And and so a lot of times you can kind of like uh, develop a false sense of, of progress by way of doing all of these other things that are seemingly easier. Maybe they're more fun. I mean, qu quite honestly, it was fun developing Gary, the green pal. We mm -hmm. were 10 years in now, Gary still lives. And like, it was fun making him. It was like that creative process was really cool. And like getting on the, you know, talking to the artists and stuff, it was a lot more fun than cold calling a hundred people that signed up for our crappy app and trying to ask them why they didn't use it after they signed in one time. It was a lot more fun than like, begging people to meet us at Starbucks or at their kitchen table to talk to them face to face and do a product walkthrough and figure out where the product sucked and try to diagnose and fix those things. Um, uh, then, then like sitting behind a whiteboard, like the, there's, there's a, the books, the lean startup is a great book about, you know, getting a business going from scratch, a, a technology business. And, and, and his, his, his mentor was a guy named Steve blank. He, he also wrote another book called, the startup owner's manual. And what those two books tell you in like 2000 pages is you have to get out of the building. You have to get out from behind the laptop and, and like hand crank your first hundred or even thousand customers to understand if you're solving a problem worth solving, to understand where you're letting them down, to let that guide your decision-making on how you move forward rather than like all of the other things that, that aren't that, <laughs> that, that aren't getting customers, that aren't figuring out what your value proposition is, that aren't figuring out where you're letting people down. The, the, you know, cold calling people and talking to people and getting told where you, where you suck is not fun. Um, mm -hmm. But in like level one of the game, that's what's required. Mm -hmm. Level six, seven, and eight, it's a bunch of other dragons you have to slay. But like level one, two, and three, that's usually what it relates to is like customer development. Am I solving a problem that people are willing to pay for? Where, where am I letting people down? What do I need to fix? And the reality is, is like your first hundred customers are going to have to be, you know, hand to hand combat. Your phone number needs to be on the homepage. Your phone number needs to be in the emails. The transactional email doesn't need to go to do not reply at examplecompany.com. It needs to go to like Brian at examplecompany.com at Josh at, at your company.com. So that people can tell you everything that you're doing wrong. 
You have to remove all the friction between you and your customer in those early days to, to figure out if you're on the right path. It's well, a lot harder to do that. It's not fun than, than, than to go sit down with a designer, design something beautiful, you know, yeah. and I made that mistake. Yeah, right. And, and well, I like what you said here. Your first hundred customers are going to be hand to hand combat. Uh, and, you know, hand to hand combat is stressful. Yeah. Uh, and it involves risk uh, and it it triggers some stress hormones and and you don't like the way that that feels. Um, I was recently uh, I spent a day with a, a lady, Dr. Loretta Brunning, and she has five or six books uh, on the topic of uh, animal behaviors and how they relate to human behaviors. And she she does a deep dive on uh, stress responses and hormonal responses and these sorts of things. I just spent an entire day with her. And so she just like packed my head full of all this stuff. And so what, what it sounds like if I were to make a, a quick and easy application here, going and facing rejection and asking somebody to like, you build this thing. And in your world that you've built around you, this is the best thing. And then I go out and I present this to someone else and they say, well, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, or I don't need that or no thanks. Uh, or why would anybody use that? And what that does is it triggers a stress response and your brain shoots your body full of cortisol and cortisol doesn't feel good. And you're like, Ugh, I don't know, man. I remember last time when I asked somebody to buy something from me and it sucked. I, I think I'm just going to stay over here and work on Gary the Green Pal because Gary the Green Pal lives in our own little world. Yep. And, and in our in our echo chamber, in our feedback loop, when the designer comes back and shows us something that we wanted to put together, then we're like, yeah, that's awesome. High fives and high fives trigger serotonin, and, which is some kind of like social acceptance. Right. And that feels exactly good. That feels good. So let's just stay over here where it feels good and not go out there where it feels bad. Yeah. And I like the way you broke that down. I think looking at these things like a scientist, almost like from the outside in and figure out why certain things are fun and certain things suck is a good way to kind of get over it. Mm -hmm. And it's a good way to kind of like just figure out, okay, yeah, that sucks because of this. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know I got to do it. And, 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 and the, and the other thing around, around the serotonin and the, and the, and, and triggering the, and dopamine, is like one thing that people do to kind of like try to short circuit short short circuit this is they'll they'll go get the feedback from like ten or twenty friends and family members and nobody wants to tell you your baby's ugly and so they're like well I got feedback well it's like did you like go get twenty credit card numbers yeah don't yeah don't don't get your feedback from friends and family like get twenty credit card numbers from people at Starbucks in the mall like. Do that, then you'll know if you're on the right track. If it's worth spending a decade of your of your life on this, and and the other thing you you mentioned was was that like you in your head and your world, you have this problem and this solution to the problem and and this product that that's delivering that solution, but but uh, but no no business plan survives first contact with a customer, and every business has like the founder logic looking at the problem from like his perspective and then the customer logic looking at the problem from their perspective. And there's always this gap between the two of founder logic and customer logic. And uh, you have to close that gap. And the only way to close that is getting the market to put down a credit card number and pay for the solution that you're delivering. And as simple as that sounds, most people try to do everything but that. They try, they, <laughs> everything, it's almost like, everything but talk to the pretty girl at the party like i'm gonna like walk you know like go over here or i'm gonna like you know it's like at the end of the day you gotta man up and go get a credit card number from 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 10 or 20 people to see if you're on the right track and and uh and it's like we have to you know i've been i've been guilty of this you know i spent i spent a long time designing gary when we didn't have any customers so i'm pointing the finger right back at me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, ultimately, that's what it comes down to, right? So we, as the owner of the business, we have to assume all responsibility for all situations, regardless of what our team is doing, uh, and how well they're performing or how poorly they're organized and all this stuff. It's really easy to get into that cycle of, ah, well, Jane and accounting is not working out. Let's get rid of her. But really, Jane and accounting is only uh, operating in the world that you created for Jane. That's right. And if you don't create a good world, then you can replace Jane with Jenny and, and she's going to do just as bad. Exactly. 
That's so true. And, and, you know, that might be like, as you get to levels three and four and five of the game, that's what it, that's a, that's a lot of what's, what's the challenging parts about those levels. It's like, okay, now you've got this organization and the organization depends on good people and how, what are the roles and the goals for each one of those people. And that's all. As, as crazy as it sounds, as hard as you think getting a hundred customers and a hundred credit card numbers is on level one, just wait, just wait till you get to that level. <laughs> yeah, That's right. a lot harder. <laughs> well, man, I love the way you think. Let's, uh, let's crack that noggin open, do a little do zone diagnostic. What do you think? Let's, let's do it. All right. This is a series of five questions I ask every guest so that we can really see how your brain ticks and soak up all the knowledge that we can. So it's rapid fire. First thing that comes to mind, just nice and nice and easy answers. What's one thing you do? that keeps you focused on your goals? Uh, one thing that I do that keeps me focused on goals is to do what I call fast forwarding the story forward. So uh, I'm, I'm sitting here today in 2022. What does this day in 2023 look like? And is it the same sales? Do I still have to lose the same 10 pounds? Do I still uh, you know, not the, you know, drive what I drive, live where I live. Do I still have the same number of, uh, of executives on staff? Do I have the same number of customers? Does the, my app look exactly the same? And if it does, that scares the hell out of me. And it scares the hell out of me to take action today to do, to do the small things day in, day out that I got to get to, 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 to get to where I'm trying to go from a year from now today, being stagnant and not moving forward and not getting things done really, really, really freaks me out. I don't like it. That's one thing when I sold my, my first company and, and, you know, thought I was just going to live the good life forever. That was fun for about two months. Mm. And, and so that, that going through that and, 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 and the fear of, st of stalling out and losing momentum is, is, is what, what keeps me accountable to do what I got to do. Yeah. And that leads into the next question here. How do you get back on track when you lose that focus? That's so hard. You know, it doesn't matter if it's business or if it's fitness or if it's relationships, um, and what I've learned in the last five years is like, just do the one little thing. It's like, like if you go to the gym is an easy example. Like, uh, don't go to the gym and work out for an hour. Just say, Hey, I'm just going to do one set. I'm just going to, I'm going to roll up in there. I'm going to do one set of chess and I'm going to roll out. That's it. And, and 99.9% .9 of the time when I'm feeling that way. And I say that I'll do the whole workout cause I'm already there. But it's the idea of like the pain and the agony of an hour or two hour workout is like, oh man, I'll just sit here. I'm tired. It's like, no, just literally just go down there, do one set of chess and then go home. That's right. And just making that little small commitment is, is what helps me get there. In business, it could be like in the early days of Green Pal, my, my co-founders and I did all the PR. And so we would do all the outreach for, for journalists. So like every day we would, we would reach out to a hundred different journalists and, there, and pretty much every day I did not want to do that. But, but the way I got through that was like, okay, just do five and I'm going to give you permission to quit doing this horrible task after five. And after I did five, I would do 20 and I was like, yeah, you might as well knock it out. So just, just, just give yourself permission to do a couple and not worry about it. Yeah. Right. There's a book by Ed Milet called the power of one more, um, that, that kind of goes along those lines of you always have at least one more in you. So if you yes. set a goal and you just keep going, then that's one of the easiest ways to to get some, some progress on that. And so number three, Brian, who is your support group and how do they keep you accountable? Well, I'm lucky to have two really good co-founders. And so a lot of times when you are founding a business, I don't advise new founders just rush out and get a co-founder because a lot of times bad co-founder dynamics can sink a business more than anything. And if we're honest, when we're starting a business with a co-founder, a lot of times it's like a coping mechanism. It's like, Oh, if I can get somebody else, this is crazy to start this business with me. Maybe I'm not dumb. So just really think through that and think about your co-founder as like your business soulmate, because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them, probably more than your actual spouse. But I'm really lucky in terms of getting two co-founders who also had a chip on their shoulder, build something big, to want to create a big business. And a lot of times, if you get that right, there's like a benevolent, um, like there, there's an there's accountability layer between you, you and your co-founders. You don't want to let them down. And that's what gets you through like the first five years, which are the hardest. And so that's what's held me accountable. And that's, that's been my support group, if you will, for the last 10 years building this company. I love it. And uh how do you approach a difficult project, Brian, that you're not sure how to complete? The one thing that gives me confidence, 
you, when I'm facing something that I have no idea uh, how to deal with it is, is just seeking out and trying to get like 80, 20 good at whatever that thing is through YouTube university, audio books, online classes, podcasts, paper books, you name it. So, so for example, like when we were building green pal, we couldn't hire a uh, afford a, uh, a product manager because they're expensive. So like I got, half ass good at how to design and build a mobile application. And it took me three months, but I learned 80% of the, of the knowledge just through 20% of the material to become a decent product manager. And that gave me the confidence to be able to deal with, with designers and engineers and developers on how to pull this sort of thing off. Um, one time uh, in my last business, I went through a really, really, really uh, nasty lawsuit uh, with, with, with a different company that was trying to acquire us. And, and, uh, I got like, I got a legal degree in six months, hmm. um, in terms of, of reading every book I could get my hands on, on business law. So usually like my, well, my, what I do is like, okay, I'm scared about this. I don't know how to do it. I'm out of my lane, but the good news is this day and age, there's, you can learn anything for free online and on YouTube. Just, just put down the time, 10, 20, 30 hours a week, learn what you got to learn to, 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 to give yourself the tools to go then get into that, get, get into the arena and fight out whatever the fight is. Nice. Yeah. I like that idea getting 80% good with 20% of the knowledge. Uh, and uh, last question here, what's the number one pro tip that you would give to someone looking to get more stuff done in less time? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's like something we all cha are challenged by. Um, Look at it this way. Um, for me, like I, 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 it was one of these books I read where, where, where the, the, the author, it might've been Atomic Habits or, or The Compound Effect, but the author was interviewing Olympic athletes. And the thing he, he, he came to find out about each Olympic athlete was, yeah, sure, they had God-given talent and so on. But, but the thing that set up like the, the, the one percenters from everybody else was their ability to endure boredom. Like the ability to just go to the gym and, and just grind out the workouts that are boring, repetitive over and over and over again, looking to edge out those, those 1% gains is what separates the greats from, from everybody else. There was another guy, another guy that uh, observed Kobe Bryant. He's like, I just want to watch you uh, practice. So he got up at four o'clock in the morning and watched Kobe Bryant practice. And like for an hour, Kobe is doing like basic bounce passes, free throws, uh, like, like he thought he was going to see Kobe do like 360 dunks and stuff. It's like, no, it's most basic fundamentals. So if you can look at like a lot of the, the, the grind and the slog of building a business that way, that it's, it's like the small things compound, they don't add up. It's not like you do, a, you do, you do a thousand small things and add up to a thousand. No, like the small things compound over time. Um, it can help manage your own personal psychology to, to just do the small things day in, day out. And, and uh, make sure you're not doing things that are le like level four, five, and six things when you're on level one and two. Know what level you're on. Look at the inputs that you have to do to get the outputs and just hold yourself accountable to do them and know it's going to be boring and slow going at first. I really appreciate the way that you position that by saying uh, the elites really are able to handle the boredom they're really able right. to have that ability to to deal with the boredom uh, and and the kobe Bryant example was that tim grover yes it's tim grover yeah that's right yeah yeah and 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 yeah, and it's two different story, authors I believe the story went something along the lines of uh he showed up to to offer some coaching for kobe uh at like 5 a.m or something and kobe had already been in the gym for like at least an hour had, had, <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, and so you've got two different authors. You got you got Tim Tim Grover, and uh, I think this the other example. Uh, but the Olympic athletes with Atomic Habits or or the Compound Effect. Okay. But you got two different authors studying peak performance. And it's basically the same thing. It's like, it, like greatness looks like these things you can't do, and the reality is is the ability to deal with and suffer boredom that makes these people great. Yeah, well said. And so. Uh, talk to me a little bit. You you already kind of went through the the uh, genesis and the journey of your business, and so so talk to me a little bit about where it is now, um, where it's looking to go in the future, and 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 who can sign up for this thing. Yeah, yeah. Currently, we're at three hundred thousand people using the app. We got to get to a million, and we have to get to a hundred million dollars a year in revenue. So that's what we're grinding towards. We want to be there in five years or less. 
If you want to uh, try out the app, just go to greenpal.com or download GreenPal in the app store or play store. And it's like, it's like DoorDash, but for your lawn care service, what you don't have to call around. You just put your address in somebody comes out and does it for you. So check it out. Nice. Uh, and, and what are some of the different ways that you're looking to, uh, to, to grow this business into a million users aside from being on my podcast, obviously. <laughs> well, I do love doing podcast interviews. They're, they're, they're a lot of fun. And thank you for having me on your show. Uh, for us, you know, uh, one thing that we focus on in terms of growth is, is just making the damn product better, making it faster, cheaper, smoother, less time to wait on the lawn guy, uh, uh, more predictable, more reliable. Um, people don't always want the cheapest service. They want the, the most reliable one. Is he going to be there on Thursday, every single Thursday? And so the, we have found the best way we can grow is just to make more people happy. As crazy as that is, it's like not go launch another Facebook campaign, not go launch uh, 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 um, a uh, Instagram Reels campaign. Let's make the product ten times or ten percent more efficient. Let's make it. Let's make it a dollar cheaper through through uh, being able to to deliver more service, more bu- more business to service providers, so they can lower their prices. So that's how we're going to get there, and that's that's that's, that's what's gotten us the first uh, thirty million, and that's what's going to take us uh, to nine figures. That's great, man. I love that we we found the best way to grow is to is to make people happy. Yeah, yeah. more make more people happy. <laughs> make more people happy. That's right. Keep making people happy, and they'll tell other people about it. Yeah, that's, that's right. The way that works. Um, awesome. Well, I really appreciate that, Brian. Uh, you know, you've uh, you have given me a, a clinic on how to build and sell businesses, and you know uh, how to play Super Mario Bros. and uh, Everything in between, man. This has been awesome. I appreciate it, Josh. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. So we're going to wrap up from here. Thanks so much to our guest, Brian Clayton, for joining us and sharing some wisdom on how he gets stuff done. Uh, Brian, could you really quickly tell us where we can go to learn more about GreenPal? Yeah, go to greenpal.com. And anybody who wants to hit me up, uh, follow me on Instagram at Brian M. Clayton. Just drop me a DM there. Excellent greenpal.com or find uh, Brian Clayton on Instagram at Brian M. Clayton. And that's Brian with a Y. Once again, if you want to keep hearing great content like this, be sure to follow and subscribe on Apple and or Spotify. And don't forget to get your own personal do zone DNA by visiting do DNA.com until next time. Remember we all have the same 24 hours in a day. What are you going to do with yours? <laughs>